Today's market call is presented by CME Group, where risk meets opportunity. And FactSet, financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow. Monday, the 11th of March, 1 o'clock on the East Coast. Guy Adami, Dan Nathan, soon to be joined by Carter Braxtonworth. Many people will think the big news is the reversal Friday in a lot of these tech names. They would be incorrect. The big news today at 1 o'clock on the East Coast is that Garrett Cole is going for an MRI on his right elbow. Now, obviously, you can make an argument that Garrett Cole is one of the top two or three pitchers in baseball. I think his Cy Young Award from last year sort of galvanizes that notion. However, Garrett Cole is one of the few pitchers in baseball that has not had Tommy John surgery. So as an ardent Yankee fan, Dan Nathan, on this March 11th, when I hear that Garrett Cole is going in for an MRI, I am concerned. Uh, but how are you? I'm doing okay. I'm concerned for Garrett Cole. Uh, again, you know what I mean? These Yankees, your Yankees, have to get back to the uh, playoffs sooner or later here, guy. Um, you know, I'm just going to say that. And I know that you don't start counting pennants until, you know, September or something like that. But it is what it is. Um, there is a lot going on. It's funny. You mentioned that Friday reversal. And it's interesting. I would have expected, guy, a little more follow through because, the, the you know, you know, you and I were talking a bit earlier. I mean, the, the amount of volume that traded from the highs to the lows and some of the biggest names in the market, you know, that have been, you know, clear market leaders over the last, you know, couple months or a few months or so, um, you expect a little follow through. Mm -hmm. I think you and I are both kind of, I don't know, maybe some of those folks who look to kind of hedge things in, in the options market or the futures market. Um, you know, we saw the VIX open up as it does quite frequently on a Monday, but trading at levels we hadn't seen in maybe a couple months or so. So maybe there's a little bit of trepidation. It's just that, you know, we don't have the follow through just yet, guy. No. Well, you don't have it just yet. Yeah. NVIDIA did trade down about 842 or thereabouts. I think currently it's trading either side of 873. So it's bounced off the lows, but still down four tenths of percent on the day. But to your point, you're not seeing the market follow through that one would have thought given the reversals on Friday and given the amount of volume. However, uh, you know, it's still obviously, you know, we're three hours or four hours into the day ish. And there's still obviously a lot of time left today and the rest of the week, which we have some, you know, important, I think, important data that will come out. But let's take a look at today's rundown because I think this is interesting. Uh, I love this industrial size problem. Hmm, we'll see about that. Oracle earnings preview. The last two quarters, uh, the stock has gotten uh, obliterated, we'll see. And chart check on yields and crude oil. That, of course, with the great Carter Braxton Worth. Yeah, well, there you go. Let's look at this, the S&P futures here because, again, you know, um, you know, new highs seemingly every day. We've been talking about that uptrend that has been holding fairly nicely. Here. Like a boss. Like a boss, as you'd like to say, um, you know, it is amazing that if you were to draw a, hor a horizontal line and we did it, I think last week, you look at mm -hmm. that breakout from December, it's lining up exactly with that moving average right there. I think that's uh, Carter's 150 day moving average. So, I mean, listen, I, I get it. If you are long and you feel like, you know, again, some of this broadening out away from some of these mag seven to the fab four, it's going into some other sectors, I, you know. I, I see things in financials that are looking pretty decent. We obviously know uh, industrials have been fine. Maybe energy started to pick up its head a little bit. I, like, I get all that. And maybe until the S&P futures break that uptrend guy, maybe you just don't have to hit the sell button in anything just yet. So we talk about trailing stops. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of pause here for a second and illustrate how you can look at a trend line in the form of a trailing stop. So what do I mean by that? So you obviously, we've drawn this uh, pretty steep uptrend line. And the market has followed it pretty consistently since November-ish, right? O late October, early November. So you see the uptrend line. With each passing day, that uptrend line gets higher. The Obviously, the levels get higher on time decay. In this case, lower left, upper right, that's going to get higher. That is effectively, Dan, a trailing stop if you think about it. So if you're long here, each day your stop gets a little higher in the form of that trend line. And each day you sort of ride the wave until it would break that trend line. And then your trailing stop in the form of this trend line kicks in. So to your point, if you're long, there's nothing, there's no urgency to get out here. The urgency, I think, comes in the form of a break. Or you could say it's just a matter of time. I want to get ahead of that. Or you could say Friday's price action scared me a little bit. Maybe I want to sort of jump the ship now. But my point is, you know, we mentioned trailing stops all the time in terms of levels. 
In this case, the trend line actually gives it to you uh, in the form of lower left to upper right. And with each passing day, the level gets a little bit higher. Yeah, and I would just say if we want to look real quickly at the E-mini uh, NASDAQ 100 futures here, um, you know, this is the one I would expect to lead to the downside guy. You know, we talk about the concentration of those large names. Um, it's obviously that much more concentrated in the NASDAQ 100. And again, if they break here, um, you know, it's going to be because, you know, Microsoft finally joined the party. Obviously, we had, you know, Apple and Google seriously lagging here. Meta's down today, which I'm mm -hmm. surprised. Meta's down off of the comment from former President Trump this morning on Squawk and Friends um, about them being the enemy of the people. And I, I like his name. I mean, listen, the guy, you know, you got to hand it to him here and there. He's got some he's got some good ones. I, I guess he's calling Zuckerberg Zucker schmuck um, now. I mean, like, that's not bad. I mean, like, you know what I mean? Like, there's been some some worse ones. There's been some better ones. That one's not bad. Uh, but I was surprised that the stock opened down 4% um, uh, on that sort of news. Were you yeah. surprised? And obviously, there's stuff going on. It's about uh, the potential. It's not about the ban of TikTok. It's whether the parent company ByteDance, which is 100% Chinese owned, right, has to divest. That's the bipartisan bill that's going to be voted on. And interestingly enough, a lot of pushback last week. I guess I'm not on the TikTok. I know you're not on the TikTok. I guess TikTok pushed out something to users, basically saying to call your congressman and you know don't let them suppress your speech and ban the the, the app and this and whatever. Pretty disingenuous because that's not what the bill is suggesting for a ban. It's suggesting no. that it's a divestiture, you know, which I, I think we could probably all be in agreement, Guy, that's not a bad thing if you're worried about privacy and security concerns and misinformation concerns. But, you know, last week, Snap and Meta caught a bid to that. This week, they're down on what Trump has to say on CNBC this morning, seemingly going against some of his prior views about fully banning TikTok. All right. So whilst I'm talking, you might as well throw a Facebook chart up or, yep. you know, I still call yep. it Facebook. Facebook. So exactly. let's just do that. Number one. Number two, your point is exactly right in terms of what it actually is. But, you know, trying to be as tactful as I possibly can. I think most people understand what a ban is. I'm not sure that most people understand what a divestiture is in terms of the way this, it's structured and what would happen here. So it's much easier to get people to rally around the thought of banning TikTok because obviously China's bad. In terms of the name calling stuff, um, you know, you have two daughters, I have three kids. You teach your kids at a very young age that name calling under any circumstances is never appropriate. So whether people find his name calling clever or not, yeah. the fact that at one time president of the United States, you know, makes a living on calling people's names is problematic. And that's not political. Personally, I don't give a shit about politics one way or another. That's just factually true. In terms of this chart, now, you can make a case, again, that for that action we saw Friday, that little engulfing pattern, you actually have some follow through today. And, you know, Carter can speak to this. You still have that gap in the chart that probably comes in somewhere around 410 or 415. And we're probably trading either side of 485 now. So that makes sense for a myriad of different reasons. And again, we talked about standard deviations away from a moving average. Seemingly, when it's to the downside, everybody gets apoplectic because, oh, my God, we got to correct back up. When it's to the upside, nobody seems to care. Well, I'll tell you, you know, historically, when you get three, four standard deviations away for a name like Apple, excuse me, Facebook, it's just a matter of time before at some point things sort of uh, find, you know, the reversion to the mead kicks into place here, Dan. Yeah, no doubt about that. Um, you just mentioned Apple. Let's do Apple for a second here because it was interesting. The story of the last, call it, week and a half or two was the underperformance of Apple and Alphabet, right? And so, again, the Mag 7 went to the Fab Four. Look at this thing. You know, you were saying, I think, 165 bucks. That was mm -hmm. the October low. That's probably a level where at least most folks who like to key on the charts would say that it's getting a little overdone. I think at its lows the other day, it was down maybe 13 14% from those recent um, all-time highs. We could throw up Alphabet there for a second, too. And you can see just with Alphabet, you know, the narrative is not too different than Apple in a way. The lack of Gen AI strategy and some of their mega cap tech peer platform companies kind of eating their lunch, at least as a way that they're kind of delivering products 
that thing also got in and around that moving average. Again, it broke through it. Uh, Carter would probably tell you they don't always have to just kind of stop at that point. Um, and then if we just want to pull up the SMH for a second, because, you know, the ETF that tracks the semiconductor index, and we know that obviously as money was coming out of Apple and Alphabet, it seemed to be finding its way into, you know, no shortage of, um, you know, AI related semiconductor names, uh, NVIDIA, top of the list, Taiwan Semi caught a massive bid over the last couple of weeks um, or so too. So it's interesting to keep an eye on this relationship. I would suspect, Guy, at some point, if the semis do really, you know, kind of start to, I don't know, snowball, it, you know, to the downside, I'll bet that that correlations among tech goes to one, meaning like there's been some dispersion right now as people are still picking through the stories and, and the like, and we had earnings season, we had lots of narratives in and around that sort of stuff. But if we get into an old, good old fashioned sell-off, you know what I mean? I would expect maybe some of the ones that have underperformed over the last few weeks to maybe outperform, but they're still going to go down. A lot there. So let's go back to the Apple chart and we'll take a look at that. And we actually, you know, we talked about 165 being a level. I think it got pretty close. Um, but here's the things that sort of stick out to me. Yeah, you get. And listen, we talked about this on the way down for Apple. We said that Apple is becoming a source of funds for these high valuation, high growth technology names. And if those names were to reverse, you'd probably see a bounce in Apple. And that's pretty much what happened. So here's your bounce now. You filled that little gap we had. That's all well and good. Problem, of course, is if you look at the moving average for the first time in a very long time, flattening out, if we continue on this trajectory lower, obviously it's going to start sloping down. So those late October lows come into play. So that's Apple. In terms of the SMH, quickly, if you could throw a longer term chart up, you'll see you had massive double tops around that 160 level and you got to go longer term to illustrate it. You can see it as clear as day. You go back into that summer. Uh, yeah, thank you. You go back to that summer, you go back to that prior high and you'll see that we stopped there dead. And then we stopped again and actually sold off pretty meaningfully. It wasn't until late last year that we got back up on a horse. As a matter of fact, it was late December when you actually outlined that NVIDIA trade you thought would break out to the upside. And there we are. So I would submit that those double tops are going to be the form of a huge support level. Now, people say there's no way we're going to trade back down about 161 or so in the SMH. I'm be like, okay, I'm not so sure that's the case. So if you start to give it up, obviously, in NVIDIA, Taiwan, semi some of these other names, I think that 160 level is that level you want to look at for key support and probably lines up with where the moving average will be if and when we get there, Dan. Yeah, and I guess the like an even more important point about that is that look at how investors reacted to the results from Broadcom and Marvell on Thursday afternoon and the guidance that they gave. I mean, they almost immediately sold both of them. I think mm -hmm. on Friday, Marvell closed down um, 11% and Broadcom closed down 7%, both down again today with Marvel down nearly... 5% and, uh, you know, Broadcom down 2%. Um, let's do it right now before we get to some of the software names, because I think this is a really important part of this conversation, Guy. Um, I want to bring Carter Braxton Worth in of Worth Charting. Hey, Carter Braxton Worth. Hey, guys. Hi, guys. Patient there, brother. Um, Talk to us a little bit about what we were just talking about. Guy just mentioned, you know, Apple was being used as a source of funds and you had this kind of last dash for some of these sort of semi names. Um, but now, you know, that reversal on Friday, what, what, what's your take on some of this price action? And then I definitely want to talk about software because we have Oracle tonight. We have uh, on Thursday, Adobe after the close. And I think these are going to be important names, at least from a narrative standpoint. Sure. So it's always, uh, you know, a series of moving parts that, come together to make a puzzle, make a narrative. And the narrative for so long has been the breath issue that the leaders have controlled everything and that many stocks haven't participated, whether it's obvious energy or utilities or REITs or less obvious certain consumer names, uh, biotech, for instance. But we're now independent of that more macro or sort of thematic uh, construct. We're starting to get bifurcation, and you guys were addressing it, within the leaders. And this has been going on. So Google's been under pressure for almost two months and Apple more than that. Apple's relative performance peaked more than two years ago. While Meta continues to streak higher, um, Amazon, of course, and so forth. Uh, the, the question is, when everything was sort of appreciating oh so well, uh, you uh, overlook, well, not you personally, you generically overlook issues, but Apple's had an issue for a while. And those, these things, Tesla's had an issue for a while. These things are all starting to get sorted out now. Um, 
And something like an Adobe, uh, we can pull that up. Adobe has rolled over and is underperforming uh, very uh, sort of substantially. And I don't think that's a particularly good bet uh, here and now. I mean, you can see a stock that's under uh, a lot of pressure uh, versus uh, the market. But either way, uh, you know, we're getting at the, the, to the tail end of earnings. Market has come a long way. And now the question is, what is the catalyst to take equities as an asset class higher? Is it lower yields? I mean, really, yields are low. <laughs> 4% 10 year money in any other universe that's nirvana. Uh, uh, what is it that drives equities higher from here? I think we've we've seen a lot and equities are a better sale than a buy. Carter, you know, you probably two in what, 20 trading days in a year, maybe a little bit less. Let's call it 215. Um, you, pretty much, you know, most of these days are somewhat benign. You don't see interesting things. And every once in a while, obviously something happens that you make note of. And I think to our earlier point, Friday was exactly that. Now, the fact that I mean, my question to you is this, the fact that seemingly every armchair technician is talking about that, does that make it any less important? Because I would say regardless of how many people are talking about it, when you see price action like that, when you see these engulfing patterns on high volume, uh, that's something that as a technician, you know, you wait around for you know, all year long when you until you get moves like that. And that's sort of a signal for a lot of people. Thoughts? Yeah, so and it wasn't just uh, specific to, I mean, well, let's pull up a chart or two just to show you. Look at some of these high flyers. Look at Abercrombie and Fitch, for instance, ANF, a uh, huge reversal. It's the most extended stock. It's ahead of NVIDIA on a two-year basis. Um, real beating going on there. Uh, so there's been a lot of this outside of tech, and uh, it's, just a, it's just indicative of a bit of exhaustion. It doesn't have to be the epic thing uh, that people talk about, a Q reversal day or, again, an outside day or uh, a, an engulfing pattern. It just signals because you made a new high, then you failed intraday. It's analogous to slipping off the chin-up bar, just struggling, struggling, one more chin-up, and then there's just nothing left. We've all been there. There's, uh, It's come a long way. There's nothing wrong with something sort of being exhausted. And I think it's across the market. It's not just an Abercrombie, which is up, but it's a Wingstop, and it's also tech names mm -hmm. across the board. Wingstop. Um, hey, uh, that's a good segue, Carter, to the IGV. This is the iShares um, software ETF. And, and, and unexpectedly, Salesforce is one of the largest holdings here. Uh, Microsoft's number two, Oracle, which reports tonight. Uh, Intuit, Adobe on Thursday, ServiceNow, Palo Alto Metrics, you see the name, Synopsys, um, uh, Cadence Group. I haven't heard of Cadence de Design. I haven't heard that name in like 15 years. Uh, and then CrowdStrike. So I drew, a, I drew a line here, Carter. You see that uptrend, right, from the October low? And it's interesting that you know about a month ago it gapped below that okay um and then made its way back up and then moved its way below that uptrend right and so now that's resistance thoughts on the software space in general and then guy and i are going to take a look at the uh the oracle implied move and in, in kind of from a fundamental standpoint there right uh it's struggling and, and just as the cues are struggling relative to the spy so if you were to look at our relative line uh you'd see that it was very clear here as an absolute chart, but uh, the relative would make it even more pronounced. And same with the Qs by virtue of Apple's waiting. This very strong area of the market, I mean, 65 October low to 90, uh, you're talking about almost 50%, right, is is starting to churn and stall and, and um, well, just that, not progress. So the question is, is it the stall as the expression goes before the storm and it really rolls over or is it more just a pause that refreshes? Either way, and it can be there, it can only be either. My hunch is to not be here, is to not uh, add to this uh, this particular IGV or anything that looks like it. All right, so I look at this, and if you go back, so you can your eye can see the trend line to the upside. If you go back to sort of, I don't know, mid-February-ish, you'll see that little island that was created on that downdraft, and then you see the subsequent move higher. So that as Carter knows, and we've pointed out a number of times, bit of an island reversal there, right? The market had a downdraft, you had this gap lower, then the next trading session, you had this gap higher. And it followed through to the upside and it felt really good. Then that trend line was violated. Now you're like, hmm. And then that gap that was created sort of got filled in. We bounced up. And now that uptrend line, which was support, becomes resistance. So I will tell you, Carter, and this is just me, in terms of this ETF specifically, now, you can say it's all that not interesting here, but the fact that, again, 
that gap file and reversal was created. We did trade higher like we should have. We filled that gap, traded back up to the uptrend line, and seemingly failed. I will tell you, this does not look all that promising to me, but that's just me. At no, it's very heavy, it, but, it, but it doesn't. The temptation always for all of us is to say, well, this is going to really crash. It's going to roll. It's, it's struck. It, it's just on the ropes, but it doesn't actually have any real torque to it, to my mm -hmm. eye. I just think it's going to grind here and waste people's time. With again, if one has to play, uh, I would be short, not long. But it doesn't uh, doesn't look like it's really yeah. unwinding in a big way. Well, and that's one reason why uh, you know we spend uh, you know a lot of time on the market call, kind of looking at some of the the uh, inputs of these broader you know indices or ETFs and the like here. And so Oracle's reporting tonight after the close, implied move is about nine percent in either direction. Guy um, about ten dollars or so. Amanda has a nice little fact set chart there showing us um, you know kind of the range in which at least the options market is suggesting the stock could go in either direction. And guy, you see those two gaps. There was two 12% gaps the last two quarters, the prior quarter um, before those two gaps was a gap higher to new all-time highs. Um, you know, I saw a research um, note this morning, actually from a tech salesman who said, well, after two gaps like that, you know, we to the downside, maybe we expect something to the upside. I, I don't know. That seems a, a, a bit um, haphazard to my liking. Thoughts here, because this is a company that is not, you know, it's funny, uh, a year or two years ago, when it was all about, you know, this kind of SaaS recurring revenue, uh, you, you know, cloud-based, blah, 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 you know, Oracle kind of got, got into the party here. There's no gen AI strategy. I'm sure they're going to try to talk about it and, and gain some efficiencies throughout, you know, their offerings and the like here. But this is a, you know, low single, oh, well, mm -hmm. it's, it's a high single digits revenue growth company. It's a low teens Earnings growth company, uh, margins, you know, well below many of their other peers here trading, you know, about a market multiple guy. I mean, it just doesn't seem that compelling one way or another. At a reasonable valuation. So, again, I didn't see that that report, but it seems somewhat non-rigorous to say since the last two were gapped lower, this one, you know, sets up to get, maybe it will. And, and that will be proven correct. It's like that crazy Ivan, you know, it's a coin flip. And if you, you know, when you're right, you look like a genius. And when you're wrong. Uh, you don't. That's Hunt for Red October for you bingo players out there. With that said, you know, the compelling thing about Oracle is it's a reasonable valuation with, you know, decent growth, not robust growth. Obviously, you mentioned the margins are not up to industry standard, but that's been the case for a while. Their integration of acquisitions has been sort of the case for Oracle for quite some period of time. They seem to do a relatively good job of it. But, you know, I don't think this is one of those stocks that's going to get away from you either way. Quite frankly, you know, I think if you're looking to get in the name, you're hoping for one of these other downdrafts. You know, hundred dollars has been sort of support a couple times, and that's probably given the implied move, the level of support once again to the downside. Yeah, and Carter, I mean, you know, unless you have thoughts here, we don't have to waste any more time on Oracle. You know, Adobe's the one that looks really interesting to me, and maybe we'll spend more time on it Wednesday or Thursday later on in the week when you're back with us. But again, that's the one year chart. It's sitting right on its moving average. Mm -hmm. And if you want to pull it out to five years, you know, like, like the underperformance relative to many of its large cap software peers, many of the you know, just the major indices is obviously undeniable. I think it's at least 20% from those prior highs. Um, if you look at that and it just not acting well into its report this week. Yeah, I mean, so many stocks have recouped all their losses. That's a meta. And then yep. gone on and made new highs. Some stocks are right back to their former highs, like a Salesforce. This one is struggling. And so while relative strength is not uh, a perfect uh, tool, it is an important tool. The relative strength is poor. Yeah. We should take a look at yields here because Carter's had a pretty steadfast view that yields are going to go lower. Um, and even when they're up at 431, you know, you thought there was a fade there in terms of yields going down. And you've been right. So let's take a look at this, Carter. And what are your thoughts? Again, one of your one of your ideas, one of your thesis has been that at some point, lower yields are not going to be uh, supportive of stocks. And maybe this is the wave where that all comes to fruition. But, you know, yields can't get out of their own way right here. You know, we thought I thought we were breaking out to the upside. That was wrong. Here we are sort of 408, 409 in the 10 year thoughts. Yeah, it has a rollover cast to it. If you if you pull this back, actually, we can pick up the October 2022 uh, level. So maybe do a three-year duration. Uh, what you'll see is this period where it's struggling here at 430, 435, that matches the high 
and draw a horizontal line right across it from October 2022. What do we know October 2022 is? So if you move that line up, yep, right to the top of October, and you'll see they touch. Okay, point being, what is that level? That's when the S&P was at its low, right? Equities are at their low because people were extrapolating. They said, oh, my God, we've gone from 250 to 450. This means 950 sell mm -hmm. stocks. Okay. And so, of course, that never happens. The reality is that we're – the same level as we were two years ago with that brief trip up to five and change higher for longer, got very breathy. Of course, it was exactly wrong. Whenever you hear a mantra run the other way, it became a gospel, a mantra, a for, for, uh, foregone conclusion. And of course, it wasn't higher for longer. Rates dropped from 5.02 to 3.8. And then down at 3.8, and this is important, just four, five, six weeks ago, they're going to cut 55 times. It's the opposite of higher for longer. Oh boy, you listen, you stay away from it. These are what they're journalists. They write articles. They have to have some reason. It's just what we know is that rates, the cost of 10 year money is cheap. And I think it's rolling over. Yeah. And now whether it gets around to lower price for stocks, the premise was higher gold, lower rates, and ultimately stocks will have to be um, sort of put yeah. in. Play a little catch up here. All right, but let, let, let's let's just kind of put a couple things together here. So last week, uh, Fed Chair Powell spoke for two days on the Hill. There were some other Fed speakers. We know that there's a Fed meeting next week. Um, you know, the yields went down in the face of what, you know, sounded like hawkish commentary to me about um, inflation, but getting closer to, there's the CME Fed funds tracker there. You see the March meeting next week. It's basically a near certainty that they will not do a thing. Um, and then if we look to the May meeting, um, which will be the next one after that, it's approaching a 20% chance possibly um, of a cut. I think most strategists, most economists are thinking, what, Guy June? July would be mm -hmm. the first spot there. So again, it seems like there's downward pressure on yields. You've highlighted the point that the Fed, um, well, the Treasury, you know, from a funding perspective, right, there's going to be um, lots of uh, debt that they have to sell, right? So um, and that's a big part of your thesis here. It's interesting. We could have drawn a line here on this and it's kind of coming up against an uptrend too. So, uh, you know, it, it, you know, this 4% level, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what that means for stocks. Because Guy, you've also made the point that there are some reasons that yields would go lower that might not be great for risk assets too. Yep, geopolitical risk. I mean, things happening obviously outside the, the U.S. economy where Treasuries become a flight to safety. I think you saw that to a certain extent with the news we got last week from China, who seemingly were throwing darts now trying to stimulate their economy. And I think that's one of the reasons yields went down. But you know, there could be a bevy of reasons that yields go lower that are not supportive of equities because something else in the world is happening that's having people come to the treasury market in this, in this perceived fl a flight to safety. Yeah, no doubt. Hey, really quickly, I want to flash this up. Amanda just put this in, and it was a, an email I saw this morning, guy, and it kind of reminds me of a conversation that you, myself, and Liz Young had on the on the tape podcast um, this morning, which drops in your favorite podcast store. There, people, so go find that out. But you know, um, so our friend Doug Cass over at Real Money uh, Seabreeze Capital, uh, this was his email: sell more to sell. We all know where that comes from. Um, but look at this chart. This is the rise and fall of the Nasdaq Composite Index. And you know, guy, what were we talking about this morning? I was like, man, this March feels a lot like and i'm not mm -hmm. trying to be dramatic march of 2000 a little bit to me because make no mistake about it i get it every strategist every bullish strategist this morning who was kind of reiterating their notes you know what i mean they were talking about um how it's different this time it's not like 2000 this or whatever i don't give a shit what you're saying like when you see a stock like Nvidia double on a narrative and granted the results have been great and the guidance has been great but they are far different than they were let's call it 6 7 months ago when they started beating and raising to the extent causing the sorts of gaps that is a bubble okay a bubble doesn't have to mean that it's a bubble that's based on poor valuation or this that whatever bubble means sentiment activity in my opinion right um as it relates to investors and what they perceive risk versus opportunity and that is clearly what's going on when you have a stock gain a trillion dollars in market cap in two months that's a bubble okay like could it keep inflating of course but when it pops, just make no mistake, just like it overshot to the upside based on whatever the current understanding and the current narratives and the current risk appetites were, it will do so on the downside. So I just want to bring that up. I think Doug 
Uh, there's a part of me and him. We share a little bit of a brain, and I appreciate him pinging on all this stuff. Carter, thoughts on that? Because I'm not asking to say what's different this time and this and whatever, but just as far as my little rant was concerned there. Yeah, no, it's all valid. I mean, look, we all want to see analogs, um, right? See a point in time, and this reminds us of that. And does it therefore play out the way it did that time, or perhaps the exact opposite? Um, and, and and bubbles are, are again, they're um, – <laughs> They're important. They go longer than people can imagine. The evaluations is not a timing tool, but it, it, it cannot be, right, if you look at some of the long-term uh, work that's done in cycles, that this is a great time to be as long and overweight equities. Uh, I, I just can't imagine that. So uh, from that point of view, I would be smaller. I would be less exposed. I would be properly cynical. Yeah. Guy, um, one area that, um, you know, you've been kind of, um, not kind of, you've been bullish on and, and, and we would detailing this, we had a futures trade uh, in crude oil uh, a, a little bit, and it's kind of fly, uh, flown in the face of some of the economic data that's we've seen, you know, in some of the areas that you think would be like a good tailwind for crude demand, right? And uh, in general here, but, you know, when, when this thing was down after that kind of break about a month and a half ago, we it was down in the low 70s. I think we both thought we would kind of get long using futures, using a trailing stop, maybe you get back towards that moving average, that kind of 79, 80 level, um, mm -hmm. a bit of resistance there, but it's still having trouble there. And it really, it feels like it might be willing to challenge that kind of uptrend channel that that's been in place over the last few months. Thoughts on crude here, because again, this is one where the dollar's been moving around, just came off a couple bucks right over the last month and a half or so, and it's still kind of stuck here. You could draw a trend line if a man wants to do it from that sort of December ish low um, that was a little bit south of 70 bucks. And you can see the points right there. Uh, that trend line will obviously be lower left, upper right. And the support level probably comes in if we could do a real time chart around 75 bucks or so. So I guess the short answer is the uptrend, I guess, is intact. I guess that's sort of the good news. The bad news, though, is. And I would actually draw that other that that other point. I would make the line a little bit lower. But my point is this: the uptrend is still, in, but it doesn't trade well. And I think even Carter would agree with that. You know, these it's not trading particularly well. And you know, it should have kept going once we violated the moving average, and we didn't. And we seemingly sort of straddle every day. So you now you can look at that and say, all right, seventy five is going to be your ultimate support. Breaks there. We're going to look at the December lows. I'm still bullish, but it sort of flies in the face of what this appears to be, Dan. Yeah, Carter, yeah, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it, that's what, like, so uh, when, when I started in the business, right, people, people the buy was a, a strong buy or conviction buy, and there's sell. And then I noticed this strange thing, whole night. Well, what does that mean? I looked into it, and it turns out, right, 5% of all stocks are whole, are sell rated. So hold is a Wall Street euphemism for sell because they don't want to offend the R. This is why the pair of twos was born. It's a non-hand. Why? I mean, why get long? There's And so here's the phrase that I use with clients. No discernible immediate opportunity to be long or short. So one could say no opportunity, but that's who's to say. Maybe there is. Discernible. To my eye, there's nothing here that says let's short. To yeah. me. There's nothing here that says let's buy. To me. So that's what a pair of twos is. It is why put capital into a hand that is better to fold the hand and get away from it than to put more money into something that is so unclear. Yeah. And, right. and going right. back to going back to narratives, you know, let, let, let's look at that, you know, because we teased it, the industrial size problem. Uh, that was an AD classic there, people. Um, let's pull up the XLI and, and you just look at how much progress this thing has made getting back to its prior 52 week high a little bit of a consolidation a little bit of check back to the breakout level at 110 and then it's been 110 to 120 you know um in a very very nice little 45 degree angle there carter um you know from my perspective if you see investors this excited about industrial stocks I would expect them to also be uh, in, in excited about industrial commodities. And so that that's kind of what the segue here is a little bit. And so mm -hmm. how, how is it that you have, you know, the stocks that would be, you know, and, and the companies that would signify, you know, economic growth or optimism about future growth and the like can be outperforming um, uh, the commodity that, that many people associate with, with the group? 
Right. And so it's across the board, big, big names from the most prominent or well-known worldwide, which would be something like Caterpillar to less known names, whether it's English, Saul Rand or Eaton or Packard, but all up, not 24 and 5% since the October likely market, but up 40, 50%. And the industrial metal, of course, copper, uh, well, I do think that looks as though it's going higher, has lagged a lot. Uh, other industrial metals like nickel and, and iron and steel and so forth, aluminum, um, well, speaking of which, look at Alcoa, AA, just for fun, man, we can pull that up. Sure. Uh, at one point, of course, the largest aluminum company in the world, the company that always reported first every quarter, now just a mere piker. But to my eye, this is the beginning of something uh, on the long side. If we did a five-year chart, you'll see it, what a wipeout this has been. And my thinking is, it, it take a shot here. Yeah, it I looks, this looks like... You, yeah. No, but to your point, I mean, we can do this in detail later in the week, but this looks like a bullish, a, a bearish to bullish reversal without question. And real quick about the XLI, I mean, you might as well throw a Caterpillar chart up because, again, I mean, these are industrial names. These are not technology stocks. I mean, but you look at the move we've seen recently, and if you go back even a little bit longer, you'll see, I mean, this is a bit of a late cycle parabolic move to the upside. And, you know, this is not a stock that typically trades that way. It's not to say it's not a good company, it's a very good company, but this is obviously one of the main components. I think they're all about four and a half to 5% in terms of the weightings in the XLI, but make no mistake, this move in Caterpillar is obviously juice this thing. And for some reason, Uber is in there as well, which I don't entirely understand, but you can look at the move in Uber as well. So when you start seeing moves that don't make a lot of sense, and then you start looking at the ETFs and the components thereof, I mean, that's when you have to say, hmm, Maybe this is something I should take another look at, Dan. Well, it's also interesting that, you know, you mentioned cat guy. Maybe they can pull up deer for a second, right? Um, and, and you know, to me, <laughs> you know, that's kind of an interesting underperformer. You know, we saw GE, which is just go, – go to a deer one-year chart, if they don't mind, uh, for a second here. I mean, that this thing is just kind of stuck mm -hmm. in the mud, right? If you look at that one. Um, we just pull up a GE for a second. This thing that looks, looks like they uh, went into the Gen AI space or they're in the GLP-1s. Um, you see what's going on with G GE, uh, and then let's pull up a Boeing, you know, and again, I, I think Boeing obviously has a lot of idiosyncratic sort of issues in a way, but these are all, you know, components um, of this ETF, which I just think is definitely interesting. So again, it gets back to that idea, like, let's keep an eye on how, you know, the, the ones that continue to work and then the ones that continue to grind or go sideways. I think that's kind of interesting. Carter, we wanted to catch your, um, get your take on this name because, Costco is not a stock that, and guy, you and I talked about it on market call last week. It's not one that, you know, you generally see big gaps in and around earnings. The reaction to its earnings and guidance last week really stuck out to us. And then the continued follow through to the downside, that purple line is a 50 day moving average. You see the 150 all the way down there. It's down about 10% from those recent highs. Thoughts on Costco and maybe on the fly, we'll pull up a couple big box. Walmart is doing well. It's green on the day. Home Depot has been doing okay. Thought, thoughts on that reaction right there? Well, the reaction oh. is is a function of the preceding strength, right? I mean, Costco is a grocery mar supermarket. Now, granted, you could say it's not. It's a SaaS multi. You pay the, you pay the $100. They're not really selling flour. All that's break even. They sell the chickens at a loss or the damn hot dogs, whatever the hell it is. But the point is that... I mean, anything that goes from 550 to 800, doesn't matter what business you're in, is pretty steep and uncorrected. And I will point out that at the high there, just a shy of 800, you're talking about a 55 PE. It has never had that high PE, uh, trading well above Wall Street's own 12-month uh, price target. And so now you've got a bit of a re-rating. And so very hard to figure out, though, is once you have a drop-in gap like that, is it on its way to 650? Does it stop here? Uh, does it bounce to 750 and then go to 650? Uh, th this is now too hard to trade, meaning the moment at which it's vulnerable extended is, is clear. Once it breaks, let's say we shorted this thing. We've been short for a week. Now we're finally in clover. It's all, all, If we cut this and take the money and it drops to 650 and we were short, that's a scrub. Let's say we say, ah, we're worried um, uh, about, uh, about staying uh, let's let's not cut it. Let's let's let this thing ride. We think it's going to sit 50 and then it bounces 750. That's a scrub. It, this is a very hard thing. So it's one of the reasons, and I'm just, it, this is important about methodology. Wall Street has this fascination with price targets. My first boss was like, wait a minute, what? What? Do you know where the stock's going to be 12 months in the future? 
That's pretty valuable information. You might want to keep that to yourself. <laughs> what a joke. 12 months out, that's why we stay away from that. We either say we think it's going to go higher or we think it's going to go lower. How much? God knows. Now, you look at this real quick before we get out of here. I mean, if you're looking to trade this thing and you and if you believe if your thesis is, okay, the bloom is a little bit off the rose here. We obviously see how quickly it can go down. We have found what support should be, probably a decent sized volume day today. Uh, this is one of those things where you say, you know what, maybe I'm going to trade it from the long side here, hold the moving average for a bounce. And then if we get that bounce, maybe 10% or so bounce or less, you know, I'll look to sort of put it right back out on the short side. So this is one that could hold here, Dan, yeah. bounce for the next leg lower, which theoretically could come in the form of the 200-day moving average. So that's how I look at this. Yeah, and just real quickly, just pull up a Walmart chart here one year. And again, the stock is, you know, it's really close to its all-time highs. And, um, you know, a heck of a move, about 20% from those October lows. So it's been a bit more deliberate um but you know this is a company that again i mean i know valuation again carter just said it before not a great timing tool i mean trades at about 25 and a half time expected growth you know mid to mid 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 single digits you know earnings and revenue growth um so not a big grower um but it's been showing here a little bit and uh i don't know i just look at these some of these um names and i say to myself listen i think that money is trying to find a home we're seeing a lot of this we started the show talking about this in in tech um in general so again um i just think it's interesting to kind of compare these two and and see um how that resolves itself all right guy you and i have a big announcement and, and carter's going to be involved in this too so really excited um about that we have a brand new sponsor um at risk reversal media that would be fidelity investments um we're going to be focused on equities uh and options and how we express uh different views in the options market if you know me and followed me um for years i was doing an in the money program um which was a direct to consumer um uh you know short video with fidelity from 2020 to about mid 2022 and um, we're really honored to have them um you know be a sponsor of market call and on tuesdays we're going to detail lots of different trade ideas and equities and options and uh etfs and using options market to kind of define risk and uh, express views in the markets. Thoughts there, Guy? Well, it's exciting. I mean, we're thrilled and honored, obviously, that Fidelity is showing the confidence in us, but it also allows us to be, you know, we're trying to become and stay more actionable. And, you know, that is going to give us an opportunity to be actionable in the half hour, 45 minutes or so of that show. So we're, ex we're thrilled. I mean, it's really exciting. Uh, obviously, in terms of, you know, that is a there is no higher stand. I mean, that is the gold standard in our business. So we're thrilled that uh, they're linking up with us for sure, Dan, Nathan. Yeah, and the, and the process is going to be simple, people. It's not too different than what we've been doing on Market Call for years. We're going to start, look at stories. We're going to look at some of the things that are in the news. We're going to look at events. We're going to try to break them down. We're going to take an approach from a fundamental standpoint, from a event-driven standpoint. Carter's going to help us out uh, with the technicals. And also, you know, listen, we love Carter's process. If you guys have been with us for all these years, you know that, um, you know, that is what he leads with. But technicals are a really important input for us. And oftentimes, you know, if you want to take, as he calls it, the fundamentals out of it and just express a view. I know you like to trade options, Carter, in and around um, your directional stuff. So we really look forward to the three of us kind of, uh, you know, going at this and, and, and having a very uh, systematic approach to it. And we're going to, you know, define our risk and we're going to manage risk and we're going to try to find some high probability outcomes. So. Uh, excited about that. So Carter's going to join us next Tuesday um, on uh, on Market Call when we start focusing, um, uh, you know, a bit more on options. But tomorrow, Guy and I are going to be here kicking it off. So thanks uh, to Fidelity. We're excited about that. Very excited about that. I want to thank, obviously, the great Carter Braxtonworth for joining us. Thank our audience, CME Group, where risk meets opportunity. I really hope that Garrett Cole is okay. Dan will be at the Magic World of Madison Square Garden with. tonight to watch the Rangers play the Devils. With and then I think you're back Carter there. Oh, with Carter Braxton. How about that? Oh. Can't wait. So if you see them, go by and say hi. Yeah, why not? All right, everybody. Thanks so All much. Right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Carter. Right. Bye.